how would we figure out how fast the atmosphere is rotating? Okay, so both A and B are reasonable ideas. Um, we could decide to track a single feature on its surface. For example, watch the great red spot of Jupiter and see how long it takes to go all the way around. Um, we could try to measure the wind speed at the equator or you know, somewhere where we might expect it to be moving the fastest. And uh, you know, we can't do this directly though. So we have to have some sort of proxy for it. We are studying it from a distance. So A is the most feasible of those ideas. Um, so this is just for measuring the atmospheric rotation, which is actually not the same as the rotation of the interior of the planet. And even different parts of the atmosphere rotate at different rates. So when you watch images, you can see for one thing that not all the gases are moving in the same direction. For example, here around the great um, red spot, the um, overall flow of the wind is opposite of the bulk flow of the rest of the atmosphere. So Jupiter is a very dynamic place. And even though it has, you know, a dominant direction for the winds, it has vortices, storms like the Great Red Spot, and the winds around there are different. Okay, and so the different layers of the atmosphere, uh, they rotate at different rates. You can see how fast the winds are moving here, for example, near the equator, and they, they seem to be moving more slowly in this spotted region. Um, and the interior rotates at a different speed entirely. So this was measured for the first time by accident. Um, so there were some researchers that were testing a radio array. They wanted to measure the Crab Nebula, which is uh, the remnants of a supernova explosion. And uh, while looking for the radio signal from that remnant, they measured an interference signal, which they basically considered useless noise. And they thought, you know, this could be related to lots of things. Maybe it's related to, um, like, they thought it could be related to vehicle traffic in the area, even though they're on like a farm in Maryland. Uh, anyway, the timing of the signal happened exactly four minutes earlier each night over several months. So they thought, okay, that seems like might be an astronomical source. Um, and they figured out it was actually due to Jupiter. So once we had a measurement that of Jupiter's radio emissions, we were able to use that to measure the um, rotation of its interior because it's the interior region that produces the magnetic field. And so any sort of radio features that we look at that are generated by its magnetic field are related to the movement of its interior. Uh, these graphs are a little bit complicated, but mostly what I want to show you here is that Jupiter does have a very strong magnetic field. It experiences aurora, just like Earth does. Uh, these are in false color, by the way. They're not, this is not like a color image. It's superimposed with the aurora signal. Um, and what the graph is telling you is that this is basically what we're looking at. We're looking at time versus frequency of the radio waves. Uh, so you can think of this as like, you know, changing the dial on the radio station. And what we see is that there's kind of a, a broad radio feature that spans multiple locations on the dial. And it's regularly spaced in time. And so this particular signal is a 10 hour and five minute rotation signal. Um, but then what this graph is telling you is that there's actually several different radio features and they all have a different periodicity. They all have a different uh, spacing of time. And so the interior speed of Jupiter has, um, well, one speed, but these other signals are coming from interactions with other things in the, in the solar system. In this case, I can't remember which one of these systems, I think system four is related to um, interactions with particles that are spewed out into space by Jupiter's moon Io, which is an extremely volcanic world. So anyway, there's a lot of rich information in radio measurements of Jupiter. And there's actually a, uh, you can contribute to a NASA project called Radio Jupiter if you're interested in helping understand these signals better. Okay, so in general, Jupiter's magnetosphere is, uh, extremely large, much larger than any of the terrestrial planets. And the illustration here is the interactions that it has with charged particles that stream off of Io. Um, it also has interactions with particles from the solar wind. 
And to understand where that magnetic field comes from, we have to dive into Jupiter's internal structure. So um, this image from your book shows the relative share of different uh, materials in the interiors of the planets. So for all of the Jovians, they have molecular hydrogen as their outermost layer in the atmosphere, which is, you know, contains also some other molecules that are clouds. Um, but for the most part, molecular hydrogen in the outer layer. And then as we dive into the interior in Jupiter, remember it's very compressed. And so as we get deeper and deeper in the atmosphere, uh, the pressure of the hydrogen is rising and rising and rising. And eventually the pressure is so high that the hydrogen is squeezed tightly together. Um, hydrogen consists of one proton and one electron in orbit around the proton. And when it's squeezed to high enough pressure, it becomes metallic, meaning the electron is no longer associated with that single atomic nucleus and is free to kind of wander around between different atoms. And so this is, you know, the electron moving around is conducting electricity. And so we call this a metal. And so it's just like how uh, electrons behave in metal wires when there's, you know, a battery attached or something like that, the electrons are free to move. So uh, this is what's happening in Jupiter's interior. It's got metallic hydrogen, and this is the metallic material that generates its magnetic field. So very different from what we think of on Earth where you know the iron and nickel core is an actual metal, um, but in the case of Jupiter, there is no um, you know, liquid metal core. It's a, a fluid metallic hydrogen. Uh, and I guess I, you wouldn't even call this a core at all because it's not near the core of the planet. It's more like that planet's mantle. Okay, Saturn also has a metallic hydrogen layer. And so it also has a magnetic field generated in the same way. And then uh, beneath that metallic hydrogen level layer is an ice and rock layer. So these are highly compressed, um, heavier molecules and you know, heavier elements near the core of the planet. But nowhere there is there like, you know, a solid surface that you could, for example, land a probe on or anything like that. It's just pressed so tightly together at the center of the planet. Um, and these icy and rocky cores uh, would have been the kind of the original material of those protoplanets in space. And the uh, hydrogen and helium would have just been attracted to those rocky and icy cores gravitationally. And so this is why, you know, the, the Jovian planets have uh, those large hydrogen atmospheres is because they had a large rocky and icy core, Earth-sized cores to attract them. The inner planets just didn't have enough hydrogen and helium to gather around because the, it's just hotter there. So that material wasn't able to condense in the inner solar system. Okay. When we look at Uranus and Neptune, they don't have that metallic hydrogen layer. They're not massive enough for hydrogen to be compressed into the metal. They still have magnetic fields though, and those are actually really poorly understood, but it's thought that the icy layers in these planets is um, somewhat conductive. So there, it's kind of like a slushy ice layer. And for whatever reason, there's enough uh, freely flowing electric charge to generate a magnetic field in those planets. Okay, so thinking about the similarities between Jupiter and Saturn here. Okay, so yes, the answer is E, all of the above. We've already seen that they both contain that liquid metallic hydrogen layer. They're both rotating very rapidly. Um, they have clouds made of ammonia crystals, and it is also true that they both emit more energy than they absorb from the sun. And that means that they must have some source of internal heat. And so it turns out that most of the Jovian planets do have some internal heat source, uh, but the, you know, the origin of that heat source is different for each one. So in the case of Jupiter, uh, it has what we call primordial heat, which is essentially heat that's left over from its initial formation. Um, and let's see, to kind of understand this, think of like as a planet is forming and it's becoming gravitationally bound, then, um, you know, if you were an individual molecule of hydrogen, for example, um, you would be speeding up as you got closer to the planet because of the, you know, the acceleration due to gravity is higher the closer you are to an object. 
right? And so the speeds are increasing. And this increase in kinetic energy is translated to an increase in heat as molecules bump into each other. And so this uh, generates heat as the planet initially gravitationally contracts. And that's what we call the primordial heat of the planet, the heat that's left over from its formation. And since then, it hasn't had enough time to fully radiate away. Um, in the case of Saturn, we know that it has a different source of internal heat. The helium in its upper atmosphere is raining into its interior. So it's essentially still differentiating. And again, as, as uh, the helium condenses and rains out, it is gaining speed and uh, releasing some of that kinetic energy as friction within Saturn's interior. So that's uh, generating a moderate source of heat in Saturn. And then in um, Neptune, there's a small heat source, but we don't know why. That label doesn't need to be there anymore. And for Uranus, it does not have an internal heat source. And we also don't know why. So the internal heat sources of the, of the planets are all different and some of them not understood at all. 